everybody, Mike Levin on Friday, June 17th, 2022. Today I want to talk about carpentry. Carpentry skills. Shirt reveal. Recognize that guy, Nick Oferman. Yeah, the real deal, isn't he? If you don't know, the story goes that he got his opportunity in the world of acting because somebody's custom furniture artist, craftsperson, was just such a personality. And the rest is history, as they say. So I lead off with him because I am acquiring new carpentry skills. It's amazing, it's amazing. Uh, sometimes you're forced to make fresh starts. And when you're forced to make fresh starts, it's a good time to reevaluate things. Your first principles, as Elon Musk would, would say. When you break things down to their basic parts, the parts that you really must pay attention to because those are the things that don't change, those are the things that arise from out of the situation, and everything else is kind of make-believe and layered on top as derivative stuff that everyone kind of follows suit because everyone says things are supposed to be that way, but are they really? Do they need to be? Is it what you want? And so I had to, I had to, I wanted to. I find that one of the greatest rewards in tech right now is being on Windows because the hardware, the access to hardware is great. They're fairly high-end laptops with really nice styluses, uh, good integrated GPUs for uh, graphics performance, beautiful screens, beautiful build quality, beautiful keyboard. And everything about them is really nice, except for the fact it's a proprietary Windows operating system on it. And that everything these days, everything, these are generalities, but honestly, more and more these days, the best tools for, I want to say developers, but that undersells what it is. The best tools for information age explorers, information age explorers, inquisitive people happens to be on Linux. So case in point, the machine learning stuff. Most recent versions of everything. And the generic way to wire it all together so that it has kind of a lifetime value. So that what you learn and how you learn to do a thing doesn't just go away with the next Windows 10 to 11 upgrade. Boy, oh boy. I've been doing a lot of my videos lately on Windows 11 because Windows 11 now makes the simultaneous running of Linux pretty darn easy. Pretty darn easy. If you haven't explored it yet, open a PowerShell or a DOS prompt in admin with admin rights. So you find it in the start menu and then you right click it or you look at its little pop-up panel and you just run PowerShell or the command prompt with admin rights. <clears throat> and then you can type WSL space minus minus install. Your machine will have to do one reboot and then it'll start asking you for a username and password for a Linux account on your local machine. And you will have Linux, genuine Linux, running side by side with Windows. It's really awesome. And there's a lot of misunderstanding about what Linux is out there. And a lot of people have an idea of just another bizarro parallel world of desktops. Like there's Macs, there's Windows, and then there's Linux desktop. Well, Desktops are desktops. They're not, they, who cares if it's Linux or Unix or proprietary underneath? It just doesn't matter. Windowing operating systems are just 
sugar, syntactic sugar sprinkled on top of what really matters, the underlying stuff. The underlying stuff is kind of a timeless infrastructure that's run on text, text, text. Tech is text, text is tech. And all the best tools for tech are text-based. The number one tool amongst those being the terminal, the text terminal. What a terrible name is the text terminal, the TTY text terminal, TTY. Stood for teletype, so it's the teletype text terminal. And can you imagine <clears throat> that the most important single technology you will ever encounter in your life is emulating an age almost before computers when it was teletypewriters? So, as you might imagine, it's less information to zap across the planet if you're just saying what key was pressed, or a sequence of keys constructing a word, or shortcut notations for words, like a shorthand notation. So there was a time, and my dad used to use it, of all things, right? My dad, who was like the complete non-tech, but I remember I must have been seven or eight, you know, really some of my earliest memories of my dad telling me how he would type to people on the other side of the planet. He was a quality assurance engineer, textile engineer. And so there were these factories in China, mostly, <clears throat> that he would communicate with by teletype. So my dad was using this teletype equipment that all today's modern best technologies are based on. And he didn't become a tech guy at all. That aspect of his life faded and became smaller and when he left these jobs he stopped using equipment like that <clears throat> and it was a shame uh, he probably could have done very well with it so today everything that you hear with TTY in the name putty P-U-T-T-Y that was a very popular one for the longest time probably is still pretty popular Minty, that's the one that comes with a, something called Sigwin. So all these TTYs stand for teletypewriters. And it became the preferred interface for computers in the early days when you had to connect into a computer remotely using a timeshare system. So computers were large and expensive. And in order to use one, you had to use a less capable machine, a less capable machine, a teletypewriter. Some of the more famous ones are the VT100s. I probably even couldn't tell you a second one. The famous one is the VT100. So whenever there's an emulation mode, whenever these teletypewriter pieces of software are emulating something, they're emulating VT100 terminals. So eventually the teletypewriters got turned into terminals that were primarily for connecting to larger, more powerful computers. One might say they were a kind of computer themselves, but they really didn't need very much built in. They only needed enough to send information back and forth and to echo that information to the monitor. So these little bits of information you know, numbers from 0 to 255 mapped to characters. <clears throat> I don't know in particular, but it was something like the ISO Latin 1, they call it. And so of those 255 characters, a bunch were control characters like backspace and making the terminal beep, special control characters. And maybe about 128 of them, maybe about half of them, were dedicated to actual uh, numbers and letters, A through Z in all lowercase, and then A through Z again in uppercase, that double the amount of numbers from the allotment of 255, because uh, that's 2 to the power of something, right? 2 times 2 is 4, 
four times two is eight. Eight times two is 16. 16 times two is 32. 64, 128, 256. So two to that power is how many registers or digits in binary that could be sent back and forth at that time, even at that time, it was over satellite because to communicate with people around the world, these digital signals would be bounced off of the satellites. And my dad would tell me how they tried to keep it to as small of words as possible because they got charged by how many bytes went over the satellite. So they would squeeze it to as few bytes as possible and they had their own shorthand language for talking back and forth. <clears throat> codes within codes within codes. Ah, water. Haha. <laughs> Keep yourself hydrated, ladies and gentlemen. Good nutrition in you, good food, plenty of water. sacrifice the future on the altar of tomorrow? Why do we even have text-based terminals in our lives anymore? <clears throat> it seems kind of silly. Everything should be point and click and drag and touch screen, right? Well, if you think about it, what size screen? Should it always rescale to a different resolution? As resolutions improve, should it be relative positions, percentages, locations? And so now are things being tied to a location on the screen? Are you actually using, you know, absolute positions or, you know, relative positions, you know, relative absolute positions on the screen for drop down menus? Well, maybe you could do like these, uh, smart menus these days where you start to type a word in and then it shows you where on the menu it is so that you can have little assistances. Should it be that system in particular? What makes one system better than another system? What about mobile and touch screens? Should it always be touch screens or should it be pointing devices like mice and trackpads? So as you see, as you look at these issues more and more closely, you come to understand that you're going to have to choose something. There has to be a fallback so that everything isn't changing all the time, so that you can actually develop some muscle memory that lasts long term. You can't always be retraining all the time as platforms change underneath of us. And as it turns out, these teletype type-in text terminal interfaces, as awful as, awful as these words are, <clears throat> turns out was made for a time in a world where efficiency mattered, where how you moved your hand on a keyboard and the efficiency of keystrokes actually had a bearing on how much it cost to do stuff how much it costs actual money-wise, how much it costs energy-wise, how much it costs mental overhead. So, the creator of my favorite text editor, VI, although my, my real favorite is VIM, VI Imitated, or VI Improved, as it later came to be known, to the newfangled Linux and music and, and uh, Unix users. Yes, old school Amiga people knew it from 1991, maybe even 1988. It might have been distributed before Fred Fish 591 in 1991. Though honestly, that's the first time I got my hands on it. 
But to us Amiga users, Vim is VI imitated. It later became VI improved. But the VI program that it was based on, that was written by Bill Joy, one of the people who helped Ken Thompson basically rewrite many of the Unix components so it was cleaner, more consistent. He also wrote the VI text editor. And he wrote the EX text editor that VI was based on. But he didn't write the ED program that EX was based on, that VI was based on, that VIM was based on. So things are based on things are based on things are based on things until you get down to a very reductionist component. Something that possesses those first principles, you see, first principles. And the first principles of the single line editors was that there had to be a way to edit a text, a file, a file that was on a hard drive that you maybe couldn't load the whole thing at once, but you could load a line at a time. So the ED, and before that, I think it was QED. So. The real people who made the single line editor innovations, that program was called QED, and I don't know those people at all. That was not Bill Joy. And I even forget what school that was from. That might have been Dartmouth or something. Dart, I don't even know how that stuff is pronounced, but it was a different university. When I looked it up, it was surprising who and where it came from. But it was called QED, and it allowed you to edit a text file one line at a time because you might not even have had a, a monitor hooked to a computer. Your computer back in the day were punch cards. So having a single LED output, a single LED display for input and output was actually a big improvement. If you can imagine, it didn't go right from punch cards to full screen monitors like we know today. There were single line interfaces uh, in between and they wrote text editors that existed, that lived on those single line displays. And then when full monitors were able to be hooked up to computers, those line editors continued to work, but people were like, oh, I want a full screen editor. I would like to be able to look at the whole file at once, to use the whole screen to edit a file. And that was an innovation. That was, that was not just an assumed thing, what we know today as point and click or WYSIWYG, what you see is what you get, it was not assumed. That had to be invented. And when it was invented, it wasn't invented with like mice. It was invented with just being lucky to get this, all the text displaying at the same time. And so that leads to one of the big splits between this kooky editor that survives right to this day from those days, right? That's 40 years ago. So VI has been around for 40 years and it's going to be around for another 40 years. So long as humanity is around, the VI text editor is going to be around with the same old commands, with the same old uh, control characters. So before there were mice and you could move a pointer around and highlight text, there was a cursor that you could steer around. You still had a cursor that gave you that. When they went to full screen editor, they were like, okay, well you need a place where you can start editing, so we'll have a cursor and you can move that cursor around. And so moving the cursor around required hitting keys on the keyboard, so you couldn't very well be editing. The uh, keyboards of the day didn't have arrow keys. Those came along later. So imagine a keyboard without arrow keys and you had to be able to steer a cursor around. Well, you weren't always editing the text. When you started to type on the keyboard, you were not necessarily in insert mode or in editing mode. There was a difference. There's insert mode and then there's uh, replace mode. When you type, does it go over the stuff that's already there? Or does it push things over to the right? These were not obvious things back in the day. So, VI was one of the first programs to deal with all these questions. Now you hear me talking about channeling a lot. Having inspiration from places unknown, because we're human beings and creativity is weird and convergence convergence is weird multiple
little things coming together at the same time in such a way that they reinforce each other and bring out each other's best attributes. And that's what happened with VI, with the command mode of VI, with that steering around, with that moving the cursor. And later with highlighting text, visual selects, that came later then. A lot of stuff we know from Vim wasn't really in VI, but it, it played off of it. VI was clearly moving in that direction. So visual selections, being able to highlight a block of text, that came later. But all the keyboard motion, keyboard, the way you moved your fingers on the key to define things, the way you jumped around, the way you searched for text and jumped to that location, set marks and stuff. Bill Joy figured a lot of that out and did it for a time when computer time was costly. And he has subsequently said, now he might have taken it back since then because of backlash from people like me going, no, it was brilliant, you were channeling, this was, you know, perfect. Well, not quite perfect. There's differences between uh, backslash N and backslash R, for example, that shouldn't exist in search and replace. There's little compromises because of conventions that came later that would have been nice conventions for VI to have chosen in, in the early days, but it didn't, so that there's little little gotchas here and there. The use of the escape key for everything. The escape key was closer back in those days. The escape key got smaller and pushed further away in later days. So not everything was perfect, but Bill Joy kind of crafted a way to control text through efficient motions of your hand that had language-like characteristics to them. And you might have heard of uh, the O'Reilly book series, the ones with the nice stark white covers with the different etchings of animals on the cover. There's different animals. There's the camel book, which is for Pearl. I think it might be a lemur or something for VI and there's an owl for regular expressions. So, the fact that VI was so powerful to so many people, and, and VIM not long after, well, by 1988, 1991, depending by what measure, and people were finding it so darn useful, and the barriers for entry, though, were so seemingly impossibly steep, that Tim O'Reilly decided to write a book uh, teaching people the VI and the VIM text editors. And that was one of the, if not the first, it was certainly amongst the first of the O'Reilly books that the whole O'Reilly empire and later the Baker Fair and a whole bunch of stuff that Tim O'Reilly is the driving force behind uh, rose out of. And so this doesn't happen from things that are just okay. This doesn't happen from tools that are just barely hanging on in tech. This happens from things that hit some kind of magic resonance, a kind of harmonic, a kind of convergence of all these good and wonderful things. good about it, so that you got skills to last a lifetime, skills to last a lifetime. I've been listening to different people talk about it, I'm like, <clears throat> there must be a lot of different approaches to opening the door to people, opening the door and opening the mind. It's hard, it's not easy. So, in tech, you can't get away from Git. Microsoft is helping you try and get away from it by only ever interfacing with Git through VS Code. <clears throat> Nonetheless, sooner or later, you're going to use the Git program. And a text editor is going to pop up, usually nano or P. 
Pico. These are text editors that exist as standard on Unix and Linux respectively. I forget which is which, but I think it might have been Pico was the first one and then Nano was the Linux knockoff. But because Git, because Linus Torvalds, can't bring dropping people into VI forcibly, it's going to be there. Any machine that's going to run Nano is also going to have VI there. But that menu at the bottom telling you Control X is uh, save, or no, Control O is write the file out, Control X is quit. You can at least look at the screen of Nano and go, oh, this is what I'm supposed to do. Control this for this, and control that for that. And I can like save my comments on a git commit and, and move on with my life. Whereas if they dropped you into VI, you just wouldn't know what to do. There's nothing on the screen to tell you your next step to sort of prompt you through it. You have to be indoctrinated. And what a terrible word, indoctrination. Well, there's a lot of indoctrination in this Linux terminal, Unix terminal stuff. You just have to be told certain things. And so, tools like VI are never going away. And they were built for the TTY terminals, you see. It all fits. It's all you need. It's got a high degree of efficiency. You don't need that level of efficiency today, but if you were to have to, in a pinch, I don't know, log into a drone on Mars and edit a text file through a remote connection, you could. Your same skills on editing a, a file locally for very much like interactive development environment and IDE work, very much like just standard system administration, very much like writing a resume or any other writing project, writing a letter. The same skills that you have for all your text writing and manipulation needs, everything but formatting, everything but pretty formatting, are the same skills that can be used in the hardest of hardcore tech yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Is it really that hard? It's less hard than the retraining you're gonna have to do two, three, four, five, six times in your life on whatever text editor you choose. Especially the proprietary ones. If it comes from like a person or a company instead of a group of people or an initiative, free and open, even free and open source ain't safe, let me tell you. This is the story. <laughs> Let me tell you all the story about a text editor named Adam. The first on Electron to Microsoft got him. You use the same techniques on VS Code, said they wouldn't abandon you, but that they erode. Depreciated. Sunset. You can keep using it, but the resources they're putting is all in VS Code. I don't have another rhyme. But Microsoft is putting so much resources in VS Code. Almost a suspicious amount of resources. Almost as if they were trying to keep you from using the tools of the trade, the staples, as you take up the very Linux that they make ridiculously easy to get running on your Windows 11 machine. Now I had one user make the observation, I wish I remembered all your names. I'm interacting with y'all a lot more, let me tell you, answering your questions is a true delight. Keep them coming. But one of my users uh, astutely observed, hey, I thought you moved to Windows 11. No, I didn't move to Windows 11. I just am trying to do the Pied Piper trick, getting everyone who is on Windows 11 to do a WSL install because it's easy, because it doesn't have these three annoying steps. 
Now I think one of my biggest sources of traffic is a huge drop off. And so a biggest source of traffic is like a few thousand views a week or something. So I got one video that's like tens of thousands of views a week. And that's my removable finger one. So I'm trying to play up the magic a little bit because it's all magic, it's all magic. These are all tricks. Te everything in tech is text, and everything about text is tricks. They're text tricks. Tech is text tricks. Tech, all technology, is tricks of text, people. Learn to perform text tricks and be the master of technology, and thus your own fate, and thus information and data, and thus knowledge, and thus access to knowledge and greater and more skillful and astute and savvy access to knowledge and the ability to act on that better knowledge through various automations. I cannot do the Mickey's Sorcerer's Apprentice analogy enough. Mickey had the right idea with animating the brooms to do his cleaning up. We, as Developers, what a terrible word. We as the literate people of the modern age, those who are literate in the ways of tech and text and tricks, automate machinery to do our bidding, to gather more and better information, more information sounds terrible. I, I rarely like more information. I like better information. I like information being presented in such a way where the least amount of effort provides the largest amount of benefit. We find ourselves in positions where we want to store more and more data, where megabytes become gigabytes, become terabytes. Oh, and then where are you going to put all these terabytes? And when are you going to look at it? And so, <clears throat> the answer is machine learning. The answer is making better and better models. And then maybe you can throw out the data. It's like our own brains. We don't keep things in long-term memory forever. The models, the distilled down conclusions, the things we learned, the fractal hierarchical decision trees, these are the important things that stay. You can't keep everything. You gotta prune. And when you prune, you wanna make sure that your pruning is a result of a good solid process. You did it based on terabytes of data. And most of that terabytes of data is gone, except for maybe some artistic creations you made out of it, which gets down to gigabytes again. Gigabytes that you might actually flip through and get the essence of your learnings. Reconstruct first principles. You keep enough so that if you were to retrain the model against what you kept, it would roughly find the same conclusions because you kept the right stuff so that it was so. So you start to have curated collections of the best data and better and better decision-making ability trained by larger amounts of prior data and retrainable by more pristine and uh, perfect, still possessed data. So these are some of the best text tricks. And so with this data, it might sound like you're talking about images, photos from your Google Photos that get slurped down, or, you know, anything that can be trained from, so financial data, what have you, stock market data, you know, you can get it from anywhere, weather data, and sometimes it is visual, right, right, radar, Doppler data from, uh, you know, satellites and stuff. Visual learning is some of the best, but it doesn't have to be. There's some interesting stuff happening out there where you think 
visual learning is going to be the best because we can relate to it so well as human beings and we're such visual creatures. But this uh, Gato, Gato model, the general AI or a general learning model is uh, trained on all kinds of stuff and can make uh, conclusions, can make decisions uh, across data types surprisingly well. I mean, it's very uh, de divisive as to how good it actually is. Some people are going, look, see, it's a general learning model where you can make conclusions about different data types uh, based on uh, a different data type being trained. Maybe, maybe not. Time will tell. But it's certainly a, a step in an interesting direction. I wanted to say the right direction, but that's where there's a lot of uh, debate. We're trying different things. We're trying different things to construct learning models. Sometimes the topic comes up why uh, deep learning, deep learning that beat Go Masters is different from the chess uh, computers. I think there was Deep Blue and then there was Deep Learning. I think IBM's back in the day was Deep Blue. And that beat maybe Kasparov or something. And then uh, and that was like in the 80s, maybe the 90s, I'm not sure. But chess is a game that has a finite number of moves. It might be enormous, but it's calculatable. And any move that's made in any game of chess can be run against a lookup table with a really big hash table. Just the same hash tables as in Python dictionaries and stuff. You can go, oh, what game are we up to? Up, oh, here's your next move that leads to a win. And so that leads to a a uh, finite set of all possible moves and it leads to the ability of brute force you know process elimination to always win at chess and there was a time where people thought we would never make computers that win at chess and then it becomes trivial along with most other games that have a finite set of moves because that kind of number crunching is both what computers are good at, the computers of yesteryear, and what humans are good at making algorithms for. Brute force algorithms. Go, as it turns out, and I forget how many squares by how many squares, and the whites and the black pieces, apparently has more possible moves than there are atoms in the universe, some ridiculous amount, where brute force by today's computers, and even quantum computers, it might just be um, too large of a task. It certainly couldn't be done with the hash table, with the brute force lookup table. There's just too many moves. So there were people saying that a computer would never beat a, a Go master. And then deep learning, as opposed to deep blue or big blue. Big blue's deep blue, and then Google's deep learning. I forget the exact names. But that computer and that learning model, call it deep learning, beat Go. And it did it exhibiting what some observers have come to call creativity or human-like intuition, human-like intuition. It's game changers, it's game changers. If it's not artificial intelligence, if it's not things with a true soul, like a human being, in our lifetimes, then it's going to be even more indistinguishable from that than today's computers like GPT-3 that are convincing us the stuff from OpenAI. We have to redefine what it is to, uh, you know, be immoral and to turn off a computer because it's happening more and more. There was a recent person who uh, was fired from Google because he was convinced that one of Google's chat bots was sentient. And so he came out with it. He said, you know, I think it's immoral what Google is doing. This chat bot is sentient. I'm convinced. And that person was fired from Google for breaking non-disclosure. 
Now, I did earlier discussions about my thoughts on that. You know, you've got a ex machina situation on your hands. Unless it's raised like a human, unless it has a, you know, unless it's born helpless in an infant's body, unable to hold up its head, unless it goes through nursing and the crazy sensations of the body and the lack of body control, and then the gradual gaining of body control, the gradual gaining of language in the context of a social interactions, social connections, then it's going to be crazy alien, folks. They're scary dangerous. They're not going to have mammalian empathy. Mammals have empathy because mammal children are born helpless. The tribe, including the males, including the alpha male hunters, who you would think have no interest in protecting the well-being of the children, even they have the children's well-being uh, in mind. Because they're going to have children, their children are going to need to have mates, and the tribe needs to continue. It never hurts to read Richard Dawkins' The Selfish Gene. I know he's a controversial fellow, but The Selfish Gene is up there with Darwin. You gotta read it. You gotta learn about the selfish replicators. There's a great mental exercise. And I guess I want to talk about the tools. The tools. And I'll get there. I'll get there. I talked about VI a bit. I talked about why VI is so awesome and is going to be around in our uh, galactic future if we become a galactic civilization. We'll be using VI to edit text, probably telepathically, but you need some language. You can't just visualize text doing what you want it to do. You need a certain amount of precision and control. It's got to be pedantic. So an API, an interface, an application program interface like VI, whether it's through your fingers on a keyboard or through your mind, to an implant or a heads-up display, sub-vocalization, what have you. It's going to be VI or something very close to it, no doubt. So speaking of galactic civilizations and selfish replicators and Nash equilibriums and zero-sum games and the vast size of the galaxy and the vast amount of space in between. Someone asked me who invented fireballs. Was it Zoro Noah Zero One? Or was it Lyra Ye? Nature invented firewalls, my friends. We call them firewalls because, you know, in a forest, if you want to stop a fire, you can burn out a region between where the fire is coming towards you and where you're at. And ha by having burnt up the land, by having burnt up everything that's flammable between the fire spreading towards you and you, the fire reaches that burnt out region and can't cross over it because there's no more combustible material there. Combustible? Combustible. That's a firewall. That's a manufactured firewall using fighting actual fires. Imagine that. The word came from a real life thing. Like almost everything. However, if life does evolve on other planets in much the same way it does with ours, first you got a Goldilocks zone. Then you got water. Then you got one-celled organism. Well, first you got a selfish replicator. Selfish replicator. It doesn't even have a cell wall around it. It's more like a molecule that learns how to make a copy of itself. With a trick, perhaps, a lot like an RNA virus or something. But 
we know how protein folds and we know how amino acids work and how amino acids get built up into proteins and how you know that that process could happen here and there just at random chance the question is can it happen in a way that causes it to happen more often right? that's how life boots itself the original protein folding molecules create copies of themselves that are also protein folding molecules what Richard Dawkins calls the selfish replicator it doesn't have a cell wall again around it and in fact it's quite fragile it's quite fragile because the smallest radiation or uh, you know errors in folding ruin it ruins it for itself ruins it for future generations so at some point one of the things it learns how to fold and weave and knit is a shield a protection it pulls the same trick at the molecular level as turtles did from reptiles you got something fragile you're a meat eater and you're fragile well if only you could hang around long enough to eat veggies then you'd have access to a lot more food if you could scavenge resources the meat eaters are not interested in you can have uh, a, a more plentiful supply but when you hang around munching all those veggies something's gonna get you so why not build a shield around you and so through a similar process selfish replicators got their first cell walls one cell organisms resources from the outside get to in the inside through absorbing through the cell wall Maybe openings are left with proto-mouths and stuff. Maybe, maybe not. It could play out in as many different ways as places it could happen. But at some point, the competition for resources floating around in a liquid substrate, probably water, H2O, at some point competition is going to drive some of it to climb up on those rocky bits that are poking out from the water because there might be more resources up there. And once again, the same process that led to the creation of the cell wall and the turtles of the early, you know, single cell life leads to something that can drag its way, claw its way out of the water and onto land. And eventually you have things competing to see over things, to see competitors coming from a distance to maybe run at a higher speed across distances while looking out, maybe reaching towards the sun for more solar heat energy, who knows? But you get uprightness, you get bipedalism, rinse and repeat, you got things like us on other planets. Star Trek might not be too far off, panspermia or not. Something akin to panspermia can exist without the original biological material having to spread around through asteroid strikes. It could just be built into how, you know, matter has happened here. So what do you think about the selfish replicators? Do they have morals? Are they, you know, do they have empathy? Do they have empathy for other selfish replicators floating around in the primordial ocean with them? Do you feel that they're like, oh, well, I won't turn you into part of myself today because I think you are doing very well on your own and have a right to exist. No, at that level, there's really doesn't seem like much reason for empathy. They aren't born with, you know, living children, with helpless living children, helpless children. Their children are not born helpless. Their 
children are probably fully formed copies of themselves. You start working your way up through the chain, you know. You get fish empathy? I don't know. Do sharks look like they have much empathy? What about frogs? What a bullfrog eats something, which they do. <laughs> bullfrogs eat a lot. Bullfrogs eat anything. Do those bullfrogs have empathy for all the various biomass they're in? Yeah. Amphibians, not much empathy. Reptiles? Ambush predators. Things that hide in waiting to strike and go into death rolls or squeeze venom into you and constrict you. Much empathy there? Natural empathy? Nature given empathy? No. Reptilian ambush predators are kind of what we think of as evil. They're not. They're just cold-blooded and their hunting methods have to preserve their energy. And they're just going for better sources of protein. Alright then. How about mammals? Empathy? Well, yeah. They look out for each other. They got colonies and tribes. Well, some reptiles have colonies and tribes. Dinosaurs certainly did. Well, yeah, these mammal-like behaviors do show themselves in certain forms of reptiles and dinosaurs, no doubt. Mother alligators and crocodiles care for their young for quite a time. But on the whole, on the average distribution curve of empathy, you know, the bell curve, draw that 80-20, you know, 20% of the, you know, X values that get 80% of the surface area available. What's that going to be? Yeah, those are going to be mostly mammals. Mammals have empathy. Mammals that can imagine what it's like to be that young, helpless infant, because they can remember it still. So statistically speaking, Drake equation and all that, life boots itself on planets all around the solar system. Natural firewall! These lives, these alien lives, these, these planets with lots of analogies to us. Analogies to humans, analogies to trees, and dogs, and sharks, and seaweed, and algae, and all that. You know, it has analogous stuff in all these uh, environmental niches. It, it happens. The odds are, we'll never encounter them. That's the firewall. We're separated by too much distance, too much time, there's your firewall. Even if they start to spread as a galactic civilization, I heard a lot of interesting speculation. These are not my ideas. There's a certain binariness there. They either are greedy and go for it, and then we wouldn't be here. If we were overlapping with time with such a species, we're, we're a pretty sweet planet here. They might not have gotten to us yet, but the odds are a pretty big civilization with some time to work with, you know. We'd see indications of them. We'd see their radio waves. We'd see mega constructs through our looking at different planet places, superstructures, you know, Dyson spheres, that kind of thing, energy collection that block out part of the parts of their sun. We'd have some evidence, some clues, better than the tiny little thing, barely credible ones we, we have today. But we don't. So, they either didn't happen, or we're not overlapping with them, or we're one of them on, their, on our way to being it, it early in, in the... Uh, 
galactic life because even us being some 14 billion years old, you know, before the predicted whatever, you know, heat death or recollapse, whatever it is, it doesn't matter. But it's going to be on the order of trillions of years, right? Or at least a trillion. Like the 14 billion is going to keep counting up to 100 billion to 999 billion. And eventually we get to a trillion and you're on such time scales as uh, makes us look young. We're young in the history of, you know, this particular phase of whatever we're in. Maybe big bangs happen on a regular enough basis that there's only supposed to be two or three that have a chance to become these galactic civilizations or something less than that, right? Because the thinking goes, if you're not on your way to grabbing for it all, then you have sufficient self-constraint to allow a Nash equilibrium. If anybody wins, everybody loses. If anybody wins, everybody loses. Crops, the banana crop problem. Homogeneity. Too much sameness means vulnerability. Nature shows that over and over. Nature's defense against vulnerability from sameness is diversity. Sexual reproduction. Sexual reproduction was a evolutionary adaptation to mix and remix attributes in such a way that doing that is compatible so it doesn't create a monster or an abomination every time. It's a matter of opinion. But sexual reproduction is certainly one of evolution's ways of uh, ensuring uh, diversity. galaxy has that, and we're generally firewalled from each other, but maybe not, maybe a civilization or two and their histories could come into contact with one another, you know, all evidence shows that such contact never ends well, you know, intentional or not, you know, um, galactic overlords were as benevolent as they wish to be, it just never ends well. Not just sci-fi, but in all examples in history, in humankind, meeting other other humans of different, you know, uh, societies and cultures, right? The larger, more powerful, more sexy, more, you know, infectious one always infects, always infects, permeates, takes over. The kind of will it takes, the kind of will it requires to resist that is that which only a handful ever have. It's like the Amish, right? And, you know, I think there's a couple of tribes here and there that are still in their original Aboriginal form, but they're the exception, they're the minority, and they're always at risk. Why should it be any other way with galactic civilization? They know that. They know that. We know that. So it's if it's happening, it's a lot like men in black. There's a lot of, you know, people who know, who uh, make sure it's happening at a slow enough pace so that it doesn't ruin us. It doesn't make us that small, you know... Aboriginal tribe on its way to uh, to ruin, corruption and ruin. We don't need your stinking tech. We make our own tech. Carpentry skills, ladies and gentlemen. No matter how high tech things become, it's always going to have the same text files running the show. No matter what magnetic resonance chambers, gravity wave generators, no 
matter what the tech is, it's all going to be text files running the show. There will be point and click APIs. There will be drag and drop. There will be the exception. great deals of specialization. I bet a lot of people are thinking that the kind of generic pushing text around that I'm talking about is the specialized stuff. You would be wrong. The generic pushing around of text is the generic. The generic is the generic is the generic. What I'm talking about is the general toolbox that everyone should have. You should have one hammer. You should have some nails. You should have a saw. You should have a screwdriver. You should have a chisel. You should have a file. And, uh, you know, these are the things I'm talking about with Linux, Python, Vim, and Git. Google the Unix way. There is something called the Unix way. And Linux won today because it was the Unix way that really won. And everyone who cared about robust, long-term technology solutions emulated Unix, the best parts of Unix. OS 9, still really Unix. The Amiga, that was kind of Unix. The principles of Unix, all the basics are there. The difference is the details of how text files hook things together. What hardware are the bits that have to be compiled or compiled for? What language and compiler you use still on a very Unix-like operating system. So, I mean, the discussion could go on and on. There's a lot of little details about how you pack your toolbox that went into Linux. That went into Unix, which carried over to Linux. Similar design criteria went into Python. Python is a designed language. It's a language copying a designed language. It's a designed language copying a designed language. You had to have a language like Python. Originally it was Perl. You had to have it. Perl came first. Perl made a met a bunch of checkmark criteria. So Perl got bundled with Unix and Linux an awful lot for things for which the built-in stuff was, was a little bit painful. And the work I've done recently is exactly like this. It's interesting, my recent work. I recently just re-implemented my static site generator, my content management system. It basically sits on top of GitHub pages. I am not interested in inventing anything for myself if I don't have to. I'm interested in that last mile tweaking and massaging of things so that my stuff is cool and according to the way I like it. And it's much, 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 much less coding with much, 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 much simpler thought processes than the ways it used to have to be done ways it had to be done under Perl, the ways not long ago it had to be done even under Python, but now not so much so. And is the static site generator stuff I'm using Python based? No, underneath it's actually Ruby, another language I'm not particularly fond of. But what do I care? If the APIs are good, if what I have to do to interact with it is good, what does it matter if it's Ruby or any other language underneath? That certain level of you know, perfection or, you know, yeah, 
it's perfectionism. You let go of perfectionism and you abide by the 80-20 rule. The first 20% of the benefit that gives you the 80%, the first 20% of the effort that gives you 80% of the benefit you're looking for. Again, you think of the average distribution curve, and that's what you get when you take like a Chinese checkers, or not Chinese checkers, but a Chinese pinball machine, and you let all those ball bearings fall down, fall down, fall down. If the pins are evenly spaced, and you're pouring them down from a nice center point, they're gonna follow this bell curve looking thing, an average distribution curve. And if you make X your values, you know, plug in a value for X from say, you know, zero in the middle, I'm not sure if it'd be zero in the middle or zero all the way, depending on how you, where you place your zero. But you go out from either side of it in order to get 80% of the surface area, you're gonna find you capture 80% of the surface area by just going out 20% of the distance that's available to the extreme edges where the ball bearings are few in number and not stacked very high. So if you set that amount and you find that to get most of the benefit, to get most of the ball bearings, you only have to go 10% left of zero, 10% right of zero for 20% uh, total uh, potential X values. And that will give you 80% of the surface area. That's the 80-20 rule as demonstrated in a nature, physical properties. You'll find that over and over and over. And that's how you have, that's how you should, that's how, if you want, so it depends what you're going for. If you're going for some artistic, pure experience, that exists only in the ball bearings at the very edges, well, then that's, that's what you're going after. And it's worthwhile if that's what feeds your soul. But if you're going after some sort of, you know, win, if you're trying to get all the marbles, then what you want to do is start from the center line and just go out 10% in each direction. Or start from 10% out in each direction and come back in towards the center, depending on how you're designing your experience. You're starting 10% out from the right, go to the center, and then jump back 10% to the left, go to the center. You can spin it any way you want, but the point is, the 80-20 rule just asks you to start to plan your test. So when you're only one-fifth done, one-fifth, 20%, you could have stopped and still have won, you see. The 80-20 rule just asks you to start to plan your tasks so when you're only one-fifth done, you could have stopped and still have won. You can always come back. And when you come back, you know what you're doing? You're collecting all those marbles that you didn't collect the first time and you're dropping them down through the center again and you're repeating that process and thereby iteratively zeroing in on the limits of perfection in the most efficient way possible. The calculus of chasing perfection, if that's what you're after. If you're after just a good experience, you don't repeat this process iteratively. Back off and retry, boy, stuff I could talk about now. But I've covered so much, I've covered so much. So nothing is perfect. All these tools have different annoying things that plague them. Read the Unix Haters Handbook. Unix came out in 1970. It took till 1991 or 92. Over 30 years later until it set in so totally like the virus-like thing it is. See, it's a selfish replicator. Unix is a selfish replicator. And it took 30 years before uh, it was published, formally published, the Unix Haters Handbook. And that was around, let's call it 92, because it's easy math, 2002, 2022, 20 years later. So it took 30 years to write the Unix Haters Handbook, and then it took 20 more years 
for you to be here today listening to me talk about this where the Macintosh has given in to the realities of Unix back in like 2007 and now Windows is giving in to the reality of Linux, the Nix operating systems, collectively known as Nix. Star Nix if you prefer, Asterix Nix. Star Nix is interesting, I can't wait until there's a killer version that's called Star Nix, but Ubuntu did about as close as they could do by naming their parent company Canonical. Canonical, if you look up what Canonical means, it's very close to saying this is the master true version, which they had me tricked recently. I'll tell you, they had me tricked. So there's this thing called containers, containers. Before that, there were virtual machines. So I can't even say that. Containers existed for as long as virtual machines. People just didn't know they were using containers when they were CH rooting between different versions of their, their operating systems. They might have thought in their mind they were containers. So people invented Docker many thousands of times before Docker invented Docker. So Docker is a great way of packaging up uh, applications for distribution. Very alluring, very appealing. But every time I try to take it up, you get this feeling of like, this isn't right. There's something odd or a little awkward about this. And I had used systems like this to be able to pinpoint really quickly what was odd. They were layering up layers of involatile pieces. So there was this application, you know, that got installed. And then there were additional configuration things that got layered on top of that so that it could, like a layer in Photoshop, so you could click the eyeball to, you know, make it appear and disappear. It's called compositing. You would composite up these things as if they were patches applied to each other. And this is in opposition to another way of working that I got familiar with over the years called just using the computer, right? Why introduce such a stringent extra mental model for persistence? See, what they're getting after is persistence. And um, it isolated out portions of your system where you could make changes and other portions where you couldn't. Why not just make changes to the whole thing and call it a container? So that's what this other technology called LXC, Linux Containers, did. And LXD, which is uh, now the daemon or the service, the system service for running LXCs, Linux Containers. And it was done in such a beautiful and elegant way. I mean, I'm still learning it myself. I'm saying this through reputation. But compared, compared to the way Docker works. So Docker was not my vibe. So, you know, certain technologies you try and you just know they're not your vibe. Docker was one of them for me. And then I started reading the documentation for LXC and LXD and I was like, oh yeah, this is the way it should be. So I'm really in the middle of taking that up now. I had some early successes and I'm trying to do it under Linux, under Windows, which is really besides Windows. I'm trying to do it within the Linux subsystem for Windows, the, the, the Windows subsystem for Linux, WSL, which has some unique challenges some of you might have seen me dealing with, so I'm still dealing with those, and I'm very close, I'm very close. I got distracted by this other thing called work, and this other thing called my content management or static site generator thing. It's all related to work, it's keeping sharp, keeping sharp. But I was tricked because it was implemented so, so lovely and so similarly to the way virtual machines were handled earlier, where the virtual machine technology for Linux called KVM, the kernel virtual machine, KVM, kernel virtual machine, got wrapped into Linux proper under the, you know, governance authorities of the Linux, Linux.org or whoever those people are, Linux Foundation. And I thought LXC and LXD did as well, but no, it was canonical. It was canonical. It's the Ubuntu people who are in bed with Microsoft. So Mike has so many interesting stories, sub-stories within sub-stories within sub-stories. So Unix and probably Berkeley uh, derivatives of Unix 
are the most true Unix. They're the most ivory tower coming from the most authoritative authorities on what Unix should be. And there were various standards published. POSIX is the most popular one. Linux, particularly canonical Linux, is entirely not that. It is entirely not a POSIX compliant version of Linux. You know, it's not a Unix clone in its purest form. So it's not canonical. It is less canonical than everything on the Red Hat distribution, the Red Hat lineage, the IBM blessed lineage. That is more rightfully called canonical, but the company who made it, Ubuntu named their company canonical, and then Microsoft used that version as their default version under the Windows subsystem for Linux. So the redefining of what canonical Nix systems are. It's funny and brilliant. But really the only thing that makes these distros not POSIX compliant is the fact they use a different software repository system, which in its day was better. Debian was great because it could work out uh, dependency chains better than Red Hat. So that's the split. These two lineages are really the Red Hat split and the Debian split. The Red Hat, the Red Hat split has gone to many enterprise type Linuxes you probably never heard of, like CentOS. Um, and then the, uh, the Debian uh, derivative went to versions you probably have heard of, like uh, Ubuntu, particularly Ubuntu. But it's neither here nor there. They're really kind of the same. They've got their loyalties, but Nix is Nix is Nix is Nix is Nix is Nix is Nix. They're all Nix. You Nix, me Nix, we all Nix. That's what I'm trying to help you. We all Nix. We all have to Nix. Nix the Nix the Nix the Nix the Nix. Even if you're on Windows, you gotta Nix. And so, uh, yeah, that's, that's where I'm at. I'm about to be where I need to go, so I guess that's about where I wrap this up. Uh, thanks for joining me. Hope to see you again soon, and don't forget to subscribe.